right. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Paige Jarvie. I am the Global Marketing Assistant here at PMMI. Uh, on behalf of PMMI, I want to thank you for joining us today. Uh, today's webinar is one of a series of webinars that we uh, have planned this year or um, you know, have continued to uh, uh, market with uh, you know, Brazil and Thailand and a couple other ones. So we're kind of keeping on the same rope. Uh, in a few moments, we will hear from Ajay Hamini. I do apologize if I mispronounced that. He is the founding partner and director at Indebras Consulting. Uh, and he'll be presenting the latest findings from PMMI's uh, Market Research Report, India Packaging Machinery Market Assessment. Um, and you know, before we continue to find out some other of the other things that we have going on, um, I do encourage everybody to visit uh, pmmi.org forward slash global. Uh, you'll be able to, uh, one, get all of the information on the India Packaging Machinery uh, Report that we are going to uh, present on today, as well as a lot of other things that we have going on. Um, and if you are attending um, PACX India before I hand it over to Ajay, who will actually be uh, at PACX India, um, I do want to let you know a few um, events and services that we have in order to prepare you to um, go over to India. Uh, like I said, we do have the newly released market research report on India. Um, at PACX India on that Friday, the 23rd from 6 to 8, there will be a presentation from none other than Ajay, um, kind of detailing a little bit more on what we're talking about today. Um, and dinner will be served, so please uh, come and, and listen to Ajay speak and get a, a nice free dinner. Um, we also have the India Agent Directory. Uh, for those who don't know, the directory uh, is a generated list of qualified international sales agents who are based out of India, and it gives you the information to connect with uh, these packaging and processing machinery agents, distributors, and representatives. Um, to kind of help you get into that target market. And uh, we also have a few complimentary services at our uh, booth. Uh, it's in Hall 1, booth number E34. Uh, we will have an on-site interpreter as well as market information, and you will get to see uh, Jorge Skirdo from Global Marketing Department. Um, so I will introduce Ajay, and I will then let him take over from here. As I mentioned, he is the managing partner and director at Indebras, uh, and he is going to help us tap into growing questions and opportunities uh, in India. Some of you may be thinking, uh, Ajay's last name kind of looks a little familiar. Uh, you're not crazy, I promise. Uh, we had Anand, uh, his brother, uh, he did the Brazil webinar back in June uh, and also was a uh, presented at FISPAL for us. So we have a long-standing relationship with them, and we do appreciate all the uh, good information that they give us. Um, Ajay and uh, Indebra specialize in global sourcing and identifying and developing new business opportunities in retail and consumer product sectors across emerging markets. Uh, Ajay has extensive experience uh, in analyzing packaging machinery and capital goods sectors in India, and has conducted several reports for PMMI over the past uh, several years. Um, so again, he will be sharing the findings on the India Packaging Machinery Market Assessment, and that is available to download on PMMI.org. Uh, quickly, some housekeeping tips. Uh, everybody is muted. Uh, they entered in the webinar on mute. And if you do have any questions, uh, please go ahead and type them in the chat box located on your lower left. And uh, Jay and I will get to them as soon as the presentation is over. Uh, and that way, uh, we can make sure we don't miss anybody's questions. 
Again, this webinar is being recorded and will be posted online um, after we conclude and everybody will be able to rewatch it in case you missed anything. Uh, so without further ado, I will present um, over to you, Ajay. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, good morning to everyone and thank you for joining in. Uh, I would like to start off by thanking both Jorge and Paige, uh, along with the rest of the PMMI team, uh, firstly for their kind introduction, and then along with that, the ongoing confidence and efforts to promote global packaging studies. Uh, that basically these studies that seek to help companies such as yours uh, to not only understand the opportunities and challenges of each market, but also to understand the cultural nuances of doing business in them and what sales and distribution approaches are needed to be mastered uh, in order to conduct business. Uh, I thank Paige for the kind introduction. Uh, I'll just give you a quick brief about myself. Um, I've been collaborating with PMMI since 2002 in both Brazil and more recently now in India. Uh, my experience, among others, uh, includes advising several FMCG companies regarding marketing and sales expansion strategies. Uh, the distribution structures that are needed for each market from imports all the way to the final sales of products, and most importantly in this case, uh, capital procurement opportunities. You see, uh, when writing the reports, uh, we always find that when preparing them, it is very helpful to take a client's view into account. And that is what we've tried to do in this report in a very pragmatic way as possible. So uh, just skipping to the next slide, let me give you a quick overview on India to set the stage. Uh, basically, to those who have not been to this market, I highly encourage one visit at least. Aside from the unique cultural experience that should last a lifetime, uh, it is currently living its golden economic and business era and uh, is set to grow at 7.5% this year compared with uh, global growth, which you see in the news or uh, through other reports that is anywhere averaging between 3 to 3.5 percent. And to top it off, this market covers 17 percent of the world's population and is rapidly becoming one of the largest consumption markets in the world. Uh, if we just put that into perspective, the population is currently four times bigger than the U.S. And another perspective of the sheer magnitude of this number is that this country has approximately 250 million households averaging about five people per household. And while two-thirds of that, yes, uh, granted, are still rural, there has been a recent urbanization trend, and there's a rise in nuclear families. And along with the growth in mid-income segment, there are driving demand for more packaged goods. So clearly, this is an opportunity that just cannot be missed. more on India, uh, it's on track to become the world's largest middle-class consumer market by 2030. And while most of the population falls within the deprived segment, uh, earning less than $2,700 per year, which is that lower section of the pyramid, there, there, there are several government social inclusion programs that are currently underway that are aimed at maybe not eradicating, because that will be too tough, but at least minimizing the poverty along with tax relief to rural segments that will drive a better level of sustainable living across all households. So there's a lot of work being done over there. Additional socio-demographic trends, such as increased participation of women and young adults in the workforce, are also bringing behavioral changes in consumption patterns. And what are these consumption patterns? Uh, so some, some patterns such as uh, a greater search for convenience, uh, change and variety, reusability, portability, and single-serve packs, along with the ready-to-eat and ready-to-cook options. Now, at the same time, and for those who have been to this market, uh, will find it fascinating, and those who haven't, uh, there is the rural and low-income segments that will drive tremendous growth of volume in packaged goods, despite not having, uh, uh, having a very low income base, particularly for those low, low price products in food and personal care sectors. I don't know if uh, anyone has come across these one rupee sachets. Uh, basically, they, they range from anywhere from condiments uh, to uh, shampoo, where it's a daily use or a one-time use. 
And if you, if you look at one rupee, that's equivalent to two cents of the dollar. So you really have a, a, a mass market volume that can be explored as well, even if you target the lower end segments. Some quick uh, basic macroeconomic indicators that I usually find are always good measures uh, for investor, industrial, and consumer confidence. India has uh, now structured its public finances, and uh, its foreign reserves are, what I'd say, at the highest levels that they've ever been, with GDP growth and inflation showing great signs of long-term stability. And all these, coupled with an impressive FDI growth, uh, which we recorded at 48% last year, has made this one of the most favored investment destinations in the globe today. So uh, these are all prime reasons to really consider entering this market if you haven't done so. Meanwhile, if we look at uh, reduced interest rates, uh, basically that means less savings and greater disposable income for consumer packaged goods. And it also means, if you look at it on the, on the client side, a reduction in borrowing costs that allows your clients to increase their capital investments, including for purchases of new machinery. At the same time, uh, we must always be weary about the controlled yet gradual depreciation of the Indian currency against the US dollar. Uh, since it reduces the amounts of funds available that local companies have available for US dollar purchases, encourages local purchases. Basically, it makes uh, U.S. imports more expensive. But if you consider uh, the, the sheer demand in the market for products and for machinery, uh, this should not impact it as much. And in summary, uh, what I'd just like to say is that the, the economic conditions are prime. They look great. And the government is really on a fast track to liberalize investment policies, reduce frictional costs, which uh, in other words, uh, de-bureaucratize uh, India and boost industrial development and domestic consumption. Moving on to uh, packaging industry. Today, it is one of the fastest growing sectors in India, where we're uh, showing a 15% compounded annual growth rate over the past 12 years to reach uh, $32 billion in 2015. Now, what's even more impressive is that with all the efforts that are going on in the market, the segment is expected to grow at an even faster pace over the next five years. And we're, we're looking at a $73 billion market by 2020, driven by A, domestic consumption, and B, retail sales. Today, there are currently over 22,000 registered firms in the Indian packaging sector alone. And this includes everything from raw material to machinery to ancillary mat material manufacturers. Uh, out of these, uh, I would say that around 15% are considered large companies, and yet 50% remain in the unorganized sector. Within this 22,000, uh, we've uh, uh, found that approximately 700 companies uh, fall in the packaging machinery manufacturers. And out of these, 85% are what you would categorize as micro, small, and medium enterprises. So what does this mean? Is that when we do talk about consolidation, and that's happening at a fast rate, this market is primed for mergers, acquisitions, and partnerships. And this you should take to your uh, corporate level uh, discussions to see that how is my entry into India going to be? Is it going to be via acquisition? via partnerships, and um, the, the market is there for the taking, but it requires a lot, a lot of homework to be done, and that we can go on and talk about further. Over the next few slides, what we'll do is we'll review some market forces that support this packaging growth, led by the booming internal consumption, which I mentioned earlier, the organized retail expansion, and other segment specifics, such as Food Safety Compliance Acts, and a shift towards consumption convenience. See, as I mentioned earlier, the boom in internal consumption is bringing about much change in the packaging segment. Now, out of the entire FDE, FDI that was recorded during the past 15 years, 8.2% belong to the FMCG sector. And uh, out of the sectors that we're covering in this report, which is the food, beverage, personal care, and pharmaceuticals, 
We're talking about a size that is just shy of combined $100 billion market. But what is more interesting other than the sheer size and, uh, is, is that uh, India has become a global powerhouse in individual segments within each sector. For instance, uh, I'm not sure if many of you are aware, but India is the second largest food market today behind China. It is the second largest producer of fruits, vegetables, livestock, fish behind Japan. And today is the largest milk producer. And it's even the fourth largest pharmaceutical producer in the world. So we're really talking about top five rankings across very important sectors of, 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 of trade. Uh, you know, and these numbers keep getting updated every day and something or another always keeps coming up. Like just last week, I read somewhere that India has overtaken Brazil and Australia as the largest uh, meat producer in the world if you combine buffalo meat uh, with, uh, with, uh, with uh, beef. So it, it's really astounding that uh, a company that is uh, a country that is um, uh, extremely religious and 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 for that nature uh, has has a certain um, uh, what do you call uh, the the constraints uh, on on purchases that uh, a market like this can even turn to be one of the largest beef uh, buffalo buffalo meat exporters. It's just astounding. We move to the next slide. Uh, another equally important driver for the packaging market is the growth in this retail market. We're, we're expecting a one trillion market by 2025, uh, where traditional retail is still occupying around 90% of the market. Online sales are also on a sharp rise, with an expected 320 million online shoppers generating close to $120 billion in sales by 2020. Now, we look at these numbers, and I've, I've, I've said quite, a, quite some, some quite large numbers uh, over the last five, ten minutes. And what does this all mean to us? Well, aside from the fantastic size and scope of the market, you know, the growing share of organized retail will require packs that promote longer product shelf life and that are sturdier to withstand for nationwide dispatches. And also the intensified competition in modern trade will also require brands to reinvent their packaging material and design, resulting in search for innovation. When we talk about food compliance, uh, in a recent uh, survey, we saw that um, there are over 50 million food producers in India today, but only 10% of those are licensed under Food Safety and Standard Regulation Authority, many which have their home-based cottage industries. So just, to sh just with the efforts that the governments are making to transform all these uh, cottage industries into uh, uh, um, formal uh, producers of food, the sheer demand for packaging is, uh, is, is off the charts, really off the charts, especially for food. And here, uh, what we have is some packaging trends that came up during our market survey earlier this year. Uh, on the food side, I'll give specific attention towards the packaging norms, which I just mentioned earlier, which are uh, generating greater enforcement of the food safety regulations uh, through multiple government authorities requiring hygienic and appropriately labeled packs, along with flexible packaging and ready to cook and ready to eat, both of which are uh, growing at 16%. On the beverage side, uh, special attention to recycling pre-mix uh, pre uh, juices and teas and carton packs. Whereas on the personal care, uh, greater attention is being given to the premiumization of products uh, so that packs can actually stand out at point of sale uh, given the intense comp competition in the market and, uh, and uh, some shift towards metal as a preferred packaging material. Meanwhile, pharmaceutical sector, uh, we're seeing some greater move from glass to rigid plastics and clean label messaging and barcodes for over-the-counter products, particularly with the uh, growth of uh, the chain drugstores that you see today in India. Now, when we look at uh, government data available regarding imports, uh, it is clear that the highest share of imports, um, and here close to 50%, occurs in the 8422-3000 code, uh, which is the HS code that uh, covers filling, closing, sealing, capsuling, or labeling, 
and aerating beverages. Um, <clears throat> so uh, we do have uh, quite a skew towards those items. But at the same time, and also not too different from other developing markets, we see Germany and Italy remain the market leaders in terms of machinery imports into India. However, recent growths have been recorded uh, by the US, by China and Sweden in 2016. And uh, I'd say that the top five markets today, uh, the top five countries today, corresponds to 75% of total imports uh, into India. And meanwhile, uh, India has an export market of its own. Uh, it does export uh, over $170 million uh, of machinery last year, uh, but mainly to Asia, Africa, and Middle Eastern markets. Now, uh, this is an important slide to understand, so I'm going to spend a little more time on it. Here, basically what we have is a simplified working example of how import duties work in India using a, a basic example of $100,000 cost insurance and freight uh, at a rate of 67 rupees to the US dollar. Now, if we look at the chart, uh, you, we can immediately see that uh, customs duty accounts for 26.5% uh, across all the three main HS codes. But if we segment it further, we see that there are five elements of customs duty. Three of them are pretty simple to understand, which are the basic uh, the, and the educational and the secondary and higher educational duties. Those are levied irrespective of what the product is. But the other two labeled CVD, which are the countervailing duty and additional duty, I wanted to touch base a bit more on that. Basically, these additional duties are levied on imports to level the playing field with domestic companies that have to pay local excise duties. And local excise duties are nothing more than inland tax on goods produced for sale or sold within the country. So basically, uh, you're having to pay this extra 16.5%. But what you should be made aware of is that similar to excise duties, these CVD duties can also be set off by your clients over a period of time. Here is where understanding the local impact of of a purchase from your client's point of view becomes very, very, very relevant. While the overall cost of the machinery is higher when measured in initial cash outlay of how much the client is actually going to have to fork out right in the beginning at the time of purchase, clients need to be made aware that they can claim the equivalent of both these countervailing duties and additional duties reaching up to 16.5% in their regular operations simply by offsetting these against excise duty payable. So for instance, your CVD, uh, you can offset over a period of two years. And the additional CVD, you can set off 100% in the first year. Now this set off is possible until the time the full amount that was paid in CVD duty is absorbed. And that is by not paying the extra, um, by not paying excise duties uh, for that period. So while the client has to pay 26.5% at the time of import, the client can actually avail the full 16.5% back in foregoing excise duty payments on local sales. And it's very important to understand this because many times when you go out for a sale or your marketing team or your local team, immediately the first thing that happens is uh, they'll look at the cost and usually it's higher than what they get in India, but they'll also look at the duty and they'll immediately be set back and say, oh my God, 26.5%, there's no way I can pay that. But what you need to make them understand is that they can recover part of that uh, in their operations. There are also some other schemes uh, that we can talk about uh, later on that are very well explained in the report. But uh, in particular, there's an export promotional capital goods uh, zero duty scheme that really allows for zero custom duties, provided the manufacturing company commits to exporting six times what he paid in the duties over a period of six years. So uh, this is why the KYC is so important in this market. So unless you don't know what your, what your client's business is, it becomes very hard to have this type of discussion with them. And, uh, and now evidently, uh, I'm sure some of you may have heard that these structures will change with the introduction of the GST, 
which is a goods and services tax uh, that is currently under debate in Parliament. Basically, it's been approved. Uh, uh, a constitution amendment bill was passed in August, just last month, in the upper house, representing all the states of the Indian Federation. And uh, the intent is to substitute India's multi-layered indirect tax consumption structure with basically a simpler tax regime that uh, allows for uniform pricing nationwide and eventually cheaper products. Now, both of these structures and rates have yet to be defined, but uh, what, do, what we will start seeing is that once this comes into effect, the entire duty structure may change. So uh, this is something that we will be monitoring closely, and uh, you should request your local teams, or at least next time, uh, for those who are coming to India, we can always have a, have a discussion and to see where, where we have progressed with this. But we believe that uh, by next fiscal year, GST should be in place in India. Uh, what now, I'll jump into uh, the actual study. Uh, when we, we conducted uh, 20 interviews with uh, FMCG companies, uh, five in the food sector, five in beverage, five in personal care, and five in pharmaceutical, along with three co-packing and conversion companies. Uh, the details of each interview are very clearly uh, written up in the report, but here I just wanted to touch base on some highlights. Uh, what we saw is across all sectors, uh, there was an overall uh, uh, preference towards Indian origin suppliers uh, with a greater skew in food and pharmaceutical and more evened out between foreign and domestic suppliers in the beverage and personal care. Uh, obviously with the exception of multinational companies that depend on their global supplier lists. And here is uh, one of the recommendations in the report is really if you are selling to one of these uh, uh, multinational clients, then you should uh, check to see if your company is already listed in their global supplier list, which would speed up the sale process uh, by eons. Uh, on, the, on the average purchasing potential, we asked each of these companies, what's your average purchasing potential on a scale of one to five, where low is, one is low and five is high. Uh, we, we, we arrived at a 3.2 average where food had the lowest propensity to purchase, uh, but not because there was no interest, but there was an underutilized installed base among the five uh, companies that we interviewed. So here what we would classify as the sector as an opportunistic expansion. So if I do see the, uh, the need to enter a new food product line, then my purchases will happen and they will be big. On the beverages side, uh, we had a 3.2 rank uh, where um, there was a need for systematic upgrades or expansions that happen on regular intervals. So here we could classify the purchasing preference towards innovation and efficiency. So show me a machine that can innovate. Show me a sh machine that can bring greater efficiency to my operations and I'm willing to, I'm willing to talk. On the personal care side, uh, which uh, that basically led the purchase potential with a 4.2 score. And here again, uh, we focus on innovation and uh, attractive pack designs for impulse purchases. So here the uh, preference was towards automation and integration. Uh, show me a machine that can uh, help me pack in multiple different sizes and uh, line extensions and I'll, I'll be ready to talk. And pharmaceuticals stood at, uh, at, the, at, three, at the three mark with a greater preference towards customization and maintenance. And we, we look at the sector as an ongoing growth sector, given that the aging population is growing and there's a growth in the um, OTC market as well. When we ask these companies uh, what, what is the process of uh, procurement, uh, who makes the decisions, uh, we found out that usually the product development teams uh, liaise closely with the marketing departments to determine the new product development departments. Then marketing takes a back seat and uh, the purchasing policies uh, are taken over by both the technical and commercial teams. And similar to most developing markets, uh, all the interviews uh, 
have taken into account traditional aspects uh, in their supplier selection processes, such as uh, quality, financial considerations, and obviously the after-sales service level agreements. Now here, uh, this chart uh, basically uh, shows some of the criteria that were raised by interviewees when considering new suppliers or packaging machinery. I'll give you a minute to take a look at it. I'm not gonna read out each point, but what one can clearly see are commonalities among all sectors, particularly in reference to words such as consistency, efficiency, material wastage, customization, and adaptability. And uh, I will explain to you a bit more about the reasons behind these words uh, in the following slide. Then again, all these, uh, all these uh, elements are very well detailed in the report. Uh, so let me just skip to the next slide. Now the following slide, this slide is, uh, I'm just gonna talk about some key takeaways from the company interviews. Firstly, there's a preference towards suppliers that are able to provide production efficiency, performance consistency, and minimal material wastage. Now, here is where we encourage uh, our PMMI members to use everything in your arsenal, from case studies to input-output calculations and even live demonstrations that speak to the packaging machine's cost-saving attributes. These will all weigh very heavily during the machine selection process. Next stage is most of the companies require trials to be conducted prior to purchase. I cannot stress how important this is. While this favors local companies, it is also a call to action for many of, uh, of you and your, your teams to maintain local operating units on ground in India. Now, in case you do not have a local team or partner, I know that PMMI regularly updates a comprehensive list of prospective agents and potential distributors, and I believe that's what Paige was referring to in the start of, the, in the start of this call. Uh, and these may assist members in India to showcase and sell their packaging machinery. I encourage members to review this list and get in touch with some of the listed contacts at your own discretion and convenience. Thirdly, this is a technical and financial sale if there ever was one. <clears throat> Basically, uh, here we have a situation where you need to capacitate your local sales team or whoever is interacting with the clients to have the technical, financial, and cultural skills to complement the sales and marketing sales pitch. They don't want just a, a marketing spiel. You need to back it up because the competition is fierce in this market. And finally, uh, limited budgets and bank finance uh, have, uh, have, have uh, given words such as integration, flexibility, customization, and ad adaptability a lot of value. Because basically what you're having is there's a large one-time cash outlay for machinery purchase. And many people are, many of these clients are saying, wait a minute, before I go and make this large investment, am I comfortable with this new product development that I'm, that I'm putting out in the market, given that there's a lot of unpredictability and that the market is extremely, extremely competitive? You know, I moved from Brazil to India just three years ago, and, I, and, and I've worked in Africa as well, and I and I have to say, I've never seen such a highly competitive market uh, as I have since I've reached India. So what, what I'm trying to say here and pass on a bit of my experience, uh, short-lived experience, is that uh, machines that we offer this market should champion the words such as integration and multitasking and one size fits all. Because the people who are gonna make those investments are gonna to have to justify to their boards uh, on how do I maximize my ROI uh, and can I extend the use of this machine to multiple product lines and line extensions? Should I be required to do so? 
maybe my, I start with a, with a product uh, A, but market realities and competition have made me shift that product into a product B or a product C, I should be able to do so with the same machine that I bought. And finally, some uh, considerations, if I could leave you with some few basic ground realities. I would say that uh, the perceived value of foreign made over domestic is really dwindling. Uh, local suppliers are building on their own technical strength to bridge this gap. And uh, performance driven ROI coupled with high processing volume speeds, ranges, integration and automation will remain the key differentiators for them to choose US machines over any other. Now basically it is about performance driven ROI. For instance, for instance let's say you're uh, promoting automation. Then consider what the prevailing labor, labor costs are in the market and how will this investment impact your client's operations before offering the machine. This is where uh, really again knowing who your client is is going to make all the impact. And uh, secondly uh, cost sensitive sensitivity remains at an all-time high. There's a boom period, but that's also matched with the competitive intensity, making this a long-term play market. Now, there are also limited availability of government schemes and bank loans that require many of these clients to dig into their personal, uh, their P&L accruals to build up their CapEx requirement. So it's, it's not so easy to go out and just get a bank loan. Uh, many of these companies are actually uh, whenever they are going to purchase, they're going to do it from their hard-earned uh, operational uh, inflows. So here, uh, what, what another opportunity that arises is to provide supplier credit against bank guarantees. Uh, here, it, it, it basically is a fairly simple process that allows uh, suppliers to receive installments via the US based banks who in turn receive local guarantees from clients bank to whom the client has pledged some assets. So basically uh, if I'm a client I'm going to pledge my assets to my local bank. My local bank is going to correspond with your bank and your bank is going to give that, uh, give that credit. Now this process basically allows clients to break down their machinery payments into installments without having to resort to local bank interest rates. It also allows clients to hedge their dollar-based investments uh, with forward covers of up to one year. And uh, that basically safeguards them against currency depreciation. So these are some areas where uh, you can really look into on how do I help making this uh, sale into a more practical sale to my clients. And finally, uh, one thing that we've seen that really helps is uh, we have a tendency to, to do a fully loaded uh, proposal. But what uh, more and more Indian companies are asking for is uh, for a decoupling of the quote by itemizing components between core and optional. And this can allow clients to better manage their budgets. So uh, with that, uh, finally, uh, I'm just uh, adding here a list of the upcoming trade fairs that many of you may benefit from while in India. I do really do look forward to meeting many of you, as many as I can, uh, with your local team representatives next week here in India at the PACX Fair. And for all those that are considering other trade fairs, uh, please do drop in a note to either Jorge, Paige, or myself saying that you plan to visit and which dates, uh, and it will be a pleasure to help you out further. So uh, I think that, that concludes my remarks uh, for today. Uh, Paige, I'm back to you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jay. Uh, that was a very knowledgeable uh, presentation. Uh, we'll now open up the floor for the audience uh, to ask any questions. Again, use the chat box on the lower left of your screen to uh, type any uh, questions you may have. Um, and while we wait for uh, questions to come in, I would uh, like to remind members, uh, if you are attending PACX India, that again, Ajay will be there uh, presenting uh, a little more in detail on what he touched on uh, this morning. Uh, uh, and the, excuse me, the dinner is on Friday the 23rd. 
Uh, you'll hear, again, firsthand um, forecasting on the packaging and process processing excuse me, machinery market. Um, and again, don't forget to stop by uh, the pavilion uh, where you can take advantage of some of the other services. Again, we do have a uh, on-site interpreter as well as uh, some market information, Hall 1, booth E34. Um, and again, you are able to chat with Jorge. He will be at uh, PACX. So let's see, we have a question um, here. Ajay, for a buyer in India, what would be the net duties and taxes paid after recovering some of the taxes and fees? Okay, thank you. Uh, basically, your, your first cash outlay is 26.5%, but then uh, you will recover 16.5% over a period of two years. And by recovering, I mean you're not getting, you're just getting a credit on the excise duties that you will have to pay as, a, as, a, as conducting your regular business in India. So uh, rather than uh, whenever I make a sale, once I've processed my goods uh, and I've got a final product, I will not have to pay the excise duty. I'll get a credit on the amount I paid on my duty. So here, uh, when you talk about net, you're paying 7.5, you're paying 2, you're paying 1. So you're paying 10.5, uh, but you're paying 26.5, you're recovering 16.5. That's an easier way to place it. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah. I did get a question also uh, asking if they can get a soft copy of the webinar. Uh, yes, you are able to, again, the webinar and the um, slideshow will be available online at pmmi.org. I will follow up this webinar with an email uh, detailing all of that information so everybody has it. Uh, we do have a couple more questions. We have a question asking, what should be the first city or region to visit when entering the Indian market? Oh, that's, uh, that's, that's, um, that's a tough one because uh, basically, I, I, I recall when I was doing a study in Brazil, uh, we, we were trying to plot every city that had more than 1 million inhabitants, and I think I reached to 15 or 13. I tried to do the same thing with India, and I just gave up after I crossed 50. So, you know, the demand is everywhere. Uh, each, each state, uh, you're looking at 29 states and seven union territories, each state is 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 a world of its own uh, with its own language its own culture uh, we've got each state has a promotional the state is very strong in promoting in industry growth so whether it be the state of Maharashtra or the state of Gujarat or the state of Tamil Nadu each one is having their own uh, uh, promotional um, promotional uh, efforts so it becomes very hard to pinpoint which is the right one. What I would suggest is uh, wherever the clients are, uh, that would be the best uh, bet. Um, because if you look at uh, even logistics complexity, what we're seeing is that many of the global clients uh, or even the, the strong domestic clients, uh, ITC, Britannia, Parley, to name a few on the food side, they are opening hubs all across India. So uh, they're not, uh, it, it, that just benefits from uh, avoiding paying freight. So I'd much rather uh, invest in the market because I know that uh, the, 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 the state itself will be, uh, will cover all my, all my, all my demands. Okay, and uh, we do have a few more questions here. What is the market share of vacuum-based packaging machinery? Uh, we, we haven't gotten into that level of detail, so uh, I, I wouldn't have that information. Uh, we can definitely look into it, uh, but uh, right now we don't have uh, uh, segmented beyond, uh, beyond the uh, HS codes, and that again is because of government data. To go a step further would be a bit uh, uh, very um, 
I'm, I'm not clear we'd get the right level of information because we'd have to do a different type of study and interview uh, each company as, a, as, a, as its own because there are no uh, government uh, data that supports uh, further details beyond HS codes. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'm not sure that this next question is a question. It says, how we analyze potential of packaging machinery in primary, secondary, and end-of-line packaging. Uh, if, correct me, or I apologize right. no, no, I'm wrong. Um, I'm not sure how to pronounce uh, last name Marathi. <laughs> um, right. If you could clarify the question, or Ajay, if you understand the question. No, I, I, I think I did. I think I did. Okay. I think that uh, we've, we've, we've got a, a huge potential all across the board. Now, uh, what, where, where, uh, where it starts getting interesting is uh, where is that opportunity? You know, where do you, where, uh, right after core manufacturing uh, comes primary packaging. And primary packaging is, I would say, the most important part today in, in the market. And why do I say that? Because secondary packaging and end-of-line automation, what we've witnessed uh, in many of the surveys that we've done and many of the factories that I've visited, you've got a huge, huge labor uh, uh, availability in all these states. And, and just to put things into perspective, uh, where you're paying around $250 a month to a worker uh, uh, or even $150 to $180 a month to a contract laborer, then your ROI for your, uh, if, if someone's going to do a, make an investment on end of line or even on secondary packaging, the ROI has to really justify it. And, 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 and Indian people, uh, are very good with numbers. They're number centric, and uh, they will get to the bottom of the, the the rupees and the cents of the rupees to see is this something that I should carry on working uh, on um, with my current labor staff, or is labor getting too complicated? Are there too many laws in the pipeline that are going to come soon that will raise the minimum wage up to 25% that will justify the shift towards um, towards uh, uh, automation and towards packaging machinery. So what I would say is that uh, your, for, your form fill seal uh, primary, and then if you start doing carton, carton bagging and uh, boxing and all that, that is still uh, hugely dominated by the labor, the labor class. All right. Uh, next question is asking, what do you think would be the market for end-of-line packaging? Uh, again, uh, I, I, it, it, would, it would have to be an estimate. Uh, basically, we're looking at, uh, at, at a still, still a, a fraction of what it could be. You know, uh, la la labor, labor is still cheap in this market, so I would, I, would, I, would, I would have to do some more homework on that. Uh, our ROI, again, is key in this market. So we don't have, uh, it, it, it would be wrong of me to attribute a percentage towards, uh, towards what is primary, what is secondary versus what's end of line at this juncture. Okay, thank you. And final question is, can we see industry 4.0 concepts in India packaging, in the India packaging machinery, or excuse me, packaging industry? Uh, by that you mean the, the getting into robotics and cyber physical systems? Um, is that like the smart, smart factory issues, right? Um, uh, yeah, I, 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 yeah, I believe, I believe, I believe that's, that's what 4.0 is, was. Okay. Uh, I, I, I right. do recall. I, I'm sure. Yeah, I'm sure some companies. I'm sure some companies already uh, do this. Um, uh, I haven't. I haven't witnessed it. I know that in the PAX there are. There will be some stands with uh, with uh, robotic uh, automation procedures. Maybe more on the pharmaceutical for hygienic purposes, uh, but and, and maybe in beverages as well. 
but uh, but food and food and uh, and personal care, I'm still seeing a lot of uh, hand labor. As I'd say that we're still on. Uh, I still I still we're still on second industry and not four point not. 2.0 instead of 4.0 right now. Uh, computer and automation, uh, along with robotics, will come into play, but I, we're, we're, we're still far away from that being, um, that being widely, widely used. All right. Well, again, Ajay, I do want to thank you. Uh, and on behalf of PMMI, to everyone, uh, thank you for participating. Um, as a final note, again, you will receive an email with links to the events and services that I spoke about, um, as well as a link for an evaluation on today's webinar. Um, if you would be so kind as to fill that out as soon as possible, letting us know uh, what we can what we can do uh, to improve, you know, how we present ourselves, or um, you know, what we can touch on more, or things like that. Um, basically to improve the webinar. Uh, and you will, again, be able to view the webinar online. I hope to get it up by this afternoon. Uh, if not this afternoon, it will be up first thing tomorrow morning. Um, but it will be uh, for viewing prior to uh, PACX India. So again, thank you everybody and have a great rest of the day.